विश्व भारती लेक्चर सीरीज टुडे अ वेरी वॉर्म वेलकम इन दिस वॉर्म आफ्टरनून ऑफ कोर्स बट वी हैव अ वेरी वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग लेक्चर टुडे अ लेक्चर ऑन म्यूजिक एंड सोसाइटी इन लेट कॉलोनियल इंडिया बाय प्रोफेसर तीर्थंकर रॉय हु इज अ प्रोफेसर इन इकोनॉमिक हिस्ट्री फ्रॉम लंडन स्कूल ऑफ इकोनॉमिक्स I will request Professor Roy, Professor Deepan Roy, to come up to the dais and please take your seat, sir. I would also request Dr. Ramit Roy, Department of German Bhasha Bhavan, to come up and take the dais because he will be introducing the speaker to us. And. Of course, Professor Asha Mukherjee, who is the chairperson of Vishu Bharati Lecture Series, and also professor in the Department of Philosophy and Comparative Religion. Well, today's lecture, Music and Society in Late Colonial India, is a study of S. Raj in Gaya. In the late 19th century and the early 20th, Indian classical music was in transition. Classical Hindustani music, as we know it today, was an outcome of this transition. Most readings of the transition stress of the choices of the professional musicians, as these musicians and the institutions in which they functioned were caught up in political and economic movements such as nationalism and commercialization. Today's presentation. is a different type of transition with a small town of professional group with a strong associational culture between musicians this second process the inaugural song Professor Vidhu Chakravarti immediately after joining us by Chancellor 
The intention and objective is to have a dialogue with really distinguished scholars, researchers, and the best minds of the country and abroad in any field. This is a platform where we can have free exchange of ideas and where we can question each other with respect and enter into a dialogue to understand each other's views. This is a step in tune with the true spirit of Vishwabharati that was emphasized by our founder. Founder, Vishwabharati represents India where she has her wealth of mind, which is for all. We plan to have distinguished scholars from any field, humanities, science, technology, games, films, arts, music, and we have no boundaries of discipline. After April, we did not have lectures due to semester examinations and summer vacation. Now, we would be having a number of lectures in this month. The next would be by Mr. Vivek Devoroy, chairperson, uh, chairman, advisory council of the prime minister. The topic is Raja and Praja, governance by governed, by the governed, on 8th August at the Department of Economics and Political Science or, and Politics. On 13th August, we would have a lecture by Professor Shubhat Bose on Shwadhinita of Desh Bhar. On 15th August, we would have a lecture by Ambassador Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti on India-Asia relations. We are documenting these lectures with audio and video recordings and they are available on Vishwabharati website. We also plan to publish so that these lectures are made available to the larger audience. Professor Pithankar Roy belongs to Shantini Ketan and is a part of our family. I extend a very hearty welcome once again to him and request Dr. Romit Roy to say a few words introducing the speaker. Dr. Romit Roy, please. Thank you, Professor Asham Mukherjee. And a very good afternoon and a namaskar to the distinguished audience. It is an honor for me to introduce Professor Deepan Kumar. It is also a great pleasure because our association goes back quite a long way. I got to know him in the early 1990s when I joined Mr. Bharati as a teacher of German. And our Association was centered around a common link with Ronadhi Roy as students of the university. Let me say a few words about Professor Trikanta. You already know he is a professor of economic history at the London School of Economics. He is also a leading historian of South Asia. He went to school in Patovahon in Shantinikatur. He did his master's in economics in the economics department of Vishwamal. He earned his PhD from the Center for Development Studies, Trivandrum. Thereafter, he taught in various institutions in India and then joined London School of Economics in 2006. He has written numerous, numerous books and articles on economic history and development studies. I will name a few. In 2018, Cambridge University Press published A Business History of India Enterprise and Emergence of Capitalism since 1600. In 2016, University of Chicago Press brought out Law and Economy in Colonial India. This was a book jointly authored with uh, Anand Swan. Now, he has written and researched extensively on Indian music, especially the history of the emergence of Indian music. And uh, I will be talking about them soon. And uh, he has been a student of Ronadhir Roy from the 1980s. And when he moved to Mumbai, he continued his uh, interest in music and uh, by training under a very, very distinguished uh, musician, uh, Pandit Vinay Bhora, who played the, uh, another very rare string instrument called the Dilruba and Tarsha Hanai. It was through the mediation and you know, the, the connections of Professor Pitlambar Roy that we were in Shantinigan fortunate enough to have a visit by Professor Vinayak Bora. Uh, sometime, I don't remember which year, it was uh, early 2000, yeah. He came to Shantinigan and gave a, a very uh, intimate um, lecture demonstration at Shongi Bhavan, demonstrating his skills on the Dilruma and playing for the students. He met Professor Mohan Singh Khangula 
and other artists, musicians of Champagne Lego. Now, Professor Ithamba Roy he not only is interested in music, practicing music, he has been researching music, and some of the uh, important uh, scholarly works that he has published are as follows Music as Artism Tradition Contributions to Indian Sociology. This came, came out, this, this came out in the journal Contributions to Indian Sociology in 1998. In 1994, he wrote another article, The Concept of Indian Music, in the Journal of Indian Council of Philosophical Research. Uh, the present talk is also based upon an article which is about to come out soon in the Journal of Asian Studies. I'm sure we are now waiting impatiently to hear uh, Professor Pitambur Roy's lecture on music and society in colonial India, late colonial India. And he will be talking about a group of musicians in Gaya who have been working with the discharge. Namaskar. Today, we have been working in Bangla, and we have been working Good afternoon, everyone, and a very big thanks to the organizers of this lecture series, especially Dr. Asha Mukherjee and uh, my guru bhai, Ramit, um, <coughs> for introducing me. It's wonderful to be speaking here. As you heard, I am an alumnus of Patel uh, Obama Vishwabharati and also a resident, Ashram. <coughs> but, um, so it's, it's always great to be coming back uh, to uh, share some of my work with, with uh, with you. Now, as you've heard, I did a double life as a scholar, as a historian, and also as a music enthusiast, part-time musician. Um, and um, from time to time, I try to combine these two roles, study music, using my skills as a historian. And this is one of the, this is an outcome of that kind of enterprise. Now let me start with a very generally accepted story about how Indian classical music, both the northern or Hindustani music and the southern Carnatic variety, changed in the last 100 or 150 years. The story says that between the mid 19th century and the mid 20th, a very big change happened in the way music was performed, enjoyed, and learned that this change influenced the styles and the content, the repertoire, and that the modern version of what we now know as classical music is not that classical, it emerged from <coughs> this process of change. The process is generally studied by our two pathways, two patterns or paradigms of transition. Common to both pathways is the idea that <coughs> before 1800, Professional musicians were maintained by temples, by courts, whereas after 1800, the extent of patronage declined, the patrons were poorer than before, and musicians had to travel far to find new market for their arts. They found that market among the rising middle class in the port cities, Calcutta, Mumbai, and Madras, as they were known then. This encounter gave rise to a new generation of musicians whose parents or forefathers were not musicians. It encouraged the formation of music schools and public concerts, reduced barriers to enjoyment and learning. Music became a popular commercial art. From this common root, historians take two directions. One of these has been developed by mainly American ethnomusicologists, which stresses the old world of the professional musician. I will call this the Harada in Transition 
story, model. Dharana has many meanings, but I will use it as a shorthand to describe the old world of music in northern India, mainly because musicians themselves have often used this term to explain who they were and how they had to change. The word loosely means a hierarchy formed of masters and apprentices, where seniority meant knowledge and power. Geographically, the old world was a small area in the western part of the indo vegetative plains. I have a map in the next slide. This is it. Um, where centuries of Indo-Islamic sponsorship of complex arts and crafts had led to a tradition of highly developed master apprenticeship. Some of the oldest masters and their gharanas in Hindustani music emerged from very small towns of almost villages in this region. Several studies published in the 1980s and 90s studied how this world changed, how this old world changed. Starting with Daniel Newman's uh, 1980 book, Life of Music in Northern India. They showed that whereas patronage and hereditary learning had led to the development of great skill were chosen. When the old world collapsed and musicians faced an audience that was less demanding, less knowledgeable, when musicians had to uproot themselves from this old world and move into the cities, the commercial world could be, uh, that, that process of change relaxed standards. Commercialization of music weakened the power of the seniors anybody could do business. And thus, commercialization led to a fall in the quality of music. In the second story, which is mainly, which is mainly developed uh, by, through the works of uh, historians, of social historians, like uh, Lakshmi Subramanian uh, and Kalpana Ram and some others, and which I call invention of tradition. In this story, music became a part of the definition of identity both national identity, sometimes caste identity. <coughs> the emerging middle class in the port city discovered classical music. They coded its grammar, its, uh, its repertoire, they gave it structure, they wrote its history. Music became classical and literate in the process. And as it did, it distanced itself from folk and popular music which now became timeless and pre -literate. In Madras city, classical music became connected with the redefinition of Tamil Brahminic identity, as Kalpana Ram and Sukhumani have shown. For some nationalists, classical music stood for the essential Indian heritage unspoiled by westernization. If the geographical context of the Karana in transition was the craft town of northern India, the invention of tradition happened in the port city. And of course, these two worlds were connected because many musicians migrated. They were forced to migrate from the old world to the new. Now you will see, just from the map uh, at the right, that there is something uh, missing in these stories. There's a lot, of, lot that is missing in these stories which is the experience of people who live somewhere in between. There are lots of towns, cities where music is going on. Outside the port city or outside this old uh, milieu where uh, the Oscars came from. What is going on there? Um, these two stories do not give us a, a, a definite clue about that. Many small town musicians or uh, people who are engaged in the arts had no link either with the study tradition of the old world or any serious interest in nationalism or identity building. They enjoyed listening to classical music because it was good stuff and decided that it was worth learning. And learned it, some of them, learned it so well that they could make experiments on it, teach and inspire others. This is exactly what happened in many small towns and about smaller communities. How do we understand 
those processes. We need another story here. We need a third story, which is what I developed here. I will call that the small town renaissance model of music history. I'll show that the small town renaissance could not happen everywhere or easily. It needed definite conditions to happen. But when these conditions were present, the music that took shape could be quite significant in the, in the context of music history. In my study, the example is a town that many of us know very well, Gaya. And the people, the community, are the Gaya walls, or the Hindu priests of Gaya, Gaya wall. A part of the social set acquired a great reputation in music between 1900 and 1960s. The reputation endured long after the masters <coughs> who built it had died. Diamonds were not a hierarchical body of masters and apprentices, as the North Indian Karanas were. They did not have strong ties with the North Indian Karanas, nor did the Gaya musicians see themselves as the bearer of a great political or nationalist ideal or a caste identity. Instead, their reputation stemmed mainly from an extraordinary innovation, which could happen only in this slightly offbeat context, and that was to develop and popularize hybrid instruments in the concert hall. The two instruments that I will talk about are Israj and Harmonium. Both, the history of both instruments is very intimately connected with what was going on in Gaya. Before I discuss that legacy, we should know something about the place and the people. Gaya is a town of about half a million people in the southern, southern part of Bihar state of Eastern India. Gaya's fame, as we know, goes to religion. The oldest part of the town, known as Andar Gaya, developed around the Vaishnav Temple, known as Vishnupat, the holiest site for the conductive rites, known as Pintadhan. But Gaya also has an association with characters from the Ramayana. It was the place where Buddha attained enlightenment and has received the patronage of great Buddhist and Hindu kings for many centuries. They built seminaries, monasteries, temples. The town is surrounded by low, isolated hills, which were and still are homes to many ascetic orders. Gaya wasn't always the city as we know it today. Its modern history as a town starts from around 1700, when the Emperor Aurangzeb or Alamgir made it a landed estate, a Jagi, called, uh, created a settlement of Pathan soldiers and named the estate Alamgir. In the 18th century, the Maratha queen Ahlabai Olkar created the present structure of the Vishnu Temple. This act of hers created a link between Gaya and the Maratha territories, especially between Gaya and Gwalia. This is something that I will come back to very soon. From, the, from this time on, the town was no longer significant as an administrative center, but it was very significant as a town in the service of religion, which is the image we have of it today. But it was still a very small town at the end of the 18th century. Its religion-based economy, the wealth of the pandas were limited in scale, but it, was, it started growing from the 19th century. Before I come to that, the source of that growth, let me talk a little bit about who the pandas were. A panda is a priest hired to perform rituals in a temple site. But they are not just any priest, not all of them. It's always possible to come to a temple town and hire on the spot a panda. But in the past, a wealthy Hindu family would normally hire one panda to perform all its rituals. There was also the custom that once one panda, that's a panda farm, performed the Pindadan ritual for a family, all future Pindadans for that family must be conducted by the same firm. So rich people did not just hire a priest for one service. They maintained a relationship with a panda farm that lasted for generations. When a partnership like this developed, some panda farms could choose to serve a small set of rich clients, very, very rich clients, and devote a lot of time to, to the clients and to itself. They didn't really need to 
look for clients. In the past, the client rewarded such exclusive service with land grants and cash rewards. The pandas spent that money in building dharamshalas. Until the 1970s, the panda managed and owned dharamshalas, where the only places where an outsider could stay in the uh, stay the night in Angarbaya. A few minutes after stepping out of the train from Calcutta, the visitor would have chosen a whole package of services consisting of a priest to perform rites, a place to stay, and sanctioned food. In the late 19th century, this elite or cream of the Panda society, who had a small set of very rich clients in Gaya, mainly served the zamindars of Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, the products of the permanent settlement of 1793. Zamindari estates, locally called Raj or Riyasa, also existed around Gaya itself. Four of them are very significant from the musical point of view. These are Pawai, Mandui, uh, Tekari, and a little further away, Darbhaga. Um, the map will give you some idea of the location of these places. Now, most Zamindars in this time, that is the big ones, lived in Calcutta, and there were, um, many of them were engaged with music. So did a large number of merchants and bankers. These people made money in Indo-European trade in opium, trade in grain, and money lending. Commodity trade, the backbone, backbone of this colonial economic system in the 19th century, increased in volume more than 20 times between 1870 and 1940. And a great deal of this trade was in the hands of Indian marchers. Pandas served the zamindars. Um, Merchants built dharamshalas in the temple towns, and these three sets of people, the pandas, the wealthy um, capitalists, and the landlords, they were constantly interacting with one another. By 1900, Angar Gaya had acquired the character that it now has, which is a dense settlement of family homes of pandas, or Gaya walls, with a few dharamshalas here and there. The core area is known as Char Patak, or Four Gates, and is almost entirely populated by Pandas. The oldest home, situated on a hillside known as Upardini, next to the temple, date back to the 18th and 19th century. And there are, there are, there are quite a few palatial homes in this area, but all of them, many of them, in, in quite bad shape. So that was, there was a, um, there was an emerging economic system, a growing economic system, which had the potential to serve music, or serve, uh, uh, serve a musical uh, flourish. By 19, uh, but until 1906, Gaya had been relatively well connected through the Grand Trunk Road, with, well connected with Calcutta, but it would still take several days of journey to reach Gaya from Calcutta. In 1906, that changed. The Calcutta Delhi Railway opened what became known as the Grand Court section, and there was soon an outburst of pilgrim inflow in the town. Around 1920, Gaya was receiving about half a million pilgrims every, every year, and only a few hundred Gayawal farms served their needs. With competition for their services being as keen as these numbers suggest, it's no wonder that in 1952, Kodiga Anthropologist, Gayawals are either rich or middle class. Seldom is a Gayawal poor. If pilgrims came to the town, the cream of Panda society traveled outside a lot because their clients insisted that they perform rites in their own homes. Only a select clientele could make, make such requests to the top Panda. <clears throat> These pandas not only had money, they also had time in hand. And they spent that leisure in clubs and boy clubs. In 1907, an ethnographic study noted that Gayawals spent a lot of their time in clubs. The women stayed at home. But among the men, club culture was big. The clubs were not just places to have an idle chat or adda but platforms for sports and popular entertainment like performance by dancing girls. 
The elite section of the awards, however, were already becoming somewhat distinct in their interest, the nature of the clubs that they maintained. Their clubs <coughs> performed music, invited musicians from the outside, sponsored wrestling, and had literary discourses. The music and literature loving pandas saw themselves as a distinct set, those who spent from those who spent, quote unquote, sleepless nights in notch watching, palm chewing, and gaja smoking. Some of this history of the Gaia walls has been studied. The most significant works are, were published in the 1950s and the 1960s, and I should cite an article in the American Anthropologist by Nagadeshwar Prasad. Um, Lalita Prasad Vidyarthi's 1961 book called Sacred Complex in Hindu Gaya. Nothing much since then, except a Cambridge uh, doctoral thesis by Catherine Pryor, which touched on the subject of the Gaya Wals. This thesis was about religion and the state rather than about social history. Now, when I read this literature together, I was surprised by two things. First, how little they discuss one of Gaya's main cultural legacies, which is music. Second, how pessimistic and negative they are about the Gaia Walls. <clears throat> the common image of the Gaia Wall was very negative in these uh, scholarly works. And I believe that it was, I believe that the image was negative because these works were written in the 50s and 60s at a time when the town's best days were over and Gaia's economy was beginning to suffer a decline. After 1950, the abolition of Zamindari came as a blow, though many Zamindars had been impoverished for a long time. <coughs> the partition led to a very sharp drop in pilgrim numbers. <coughs> Lalita Prasad Vidyarthi wrote his book, When the Fall Had Begun, and in his reading, the community of Gayawals had become so luxury loving, loving, idle, insular, and conservative, lazy, because, because of the easy time that they had run for so long that they could not adapt to this economic shock. Instead of finding better ways to manage the crisis, they exploited and cheated their clients with more and more skill, tried to extract money on some pretext or on another. Later research echoed the same sentiment, to quote from a very recent work about temples, quote, the Gaya Pandas stand in particularly low public repute. They have become a byword as far away as the South of India and the name is said to be a synonym for cheat in Tamil." Unquote. Now what these negative remarks miss is that the Gayawals were already in the 20th century a very unequal society when this fall began. That there was an upper stratum which had built, built its reputation on cultural accomplishments and not on how well they could cheat their clients. By 1950, this small upper class had established strong ties with the high culture of Canada. And music was a big part of that high culture, that connection with Gaia and Canada. But it's not just two cities. The people who are bridging these two cities were highly talented musicians. And Gaia's reputation in music really owed to three key individuals, kind of connecting figures who were either pandas or very closely connected with the Panda society. Let me talk about these three individuals briefly. The three individuals are close contemporaries, Anaya Lal Dheri and Dhanumanda Singh, and Chandrika Prasad, and slightly later Chandrika Prasad Dubey. All three artists chose the estrage as their main instrument at a time when the music world was not familiar with this instrument at all. That's turn of the 20th century. So what is estrage? Um, this question probably doesn't uh, require an answer here to the audience like this, but I will still try to give an answer because that helps me explain a few things about these people. Estrage was designed as a smaller version of the sitar, then to be played as a bowed instrument. The construction of modern estrage is quite similar to that of the sitar. Objects in museums and pictures in 19th century reference books suggest that the conversion of older plucking instruments into bowed ones 
was something that is going on in the 19th century quite actively among many people and led to many experimental versions of which probably four survive today. Taush, Bilruba, Tashana, and the Strauss. But then if you look around the kind of Strauss that people play, you will see, you will see, you will see that it's not a, uh, there's no uh, set uh, shape. It's, it's still under experiment. We do not know who invented these and exactly when. We do know that they were created as instruments to accompany vocal music. It's an effect of the concert hall, or music moving into the concert hall. But then a few exceptionally talented people went further and turned the, these into solo instruments as, as mediums of classical music in their own right. The three people I want to discuss were significant in that way. Kanaya Lal and Hunuman Das were contemporaries. Kanaya Lal was, uh, was a Pandar, uh, the head of the Pandar firm. The other one was not, but they were both raised in the same household. Now, there is a difference, a discrepancy between two accounts of who learned music from whom and who was the order of the two. I will discuss this discrepancy very briefly because it says something about how we normally think about the history of Indian music. One of these accounts comes from Bimala Kantor Achyaguri, a music scholar and a Strauss player and an advisor to the Oxford Encyclopedia of Indian Music. Bimala Kantor's guru was an Strauss player called Shital Chattamukhubadhyay, who is said to have been taught by Kanaya Lal. According to Bimala Kantor, Numan Das was the older of the two. He came to Gaya as a finished musician and taught Kanaya Lal. According to the second account, which comes from the Panda historians in Gaya, Anayalal was a senior figure and he was self-taught in his charge. I cannot say which account is right. I don't think Vimala Kanti would rely on anything more solid than hearsay. But the dispute is interesting. It shows how keenly historians try to discover a Guru Shishwar Islam Shaged lineage when none can be found. Pandas, on the other hand, are very keen to say that Israj is our heritage and our heritage is not a hierarchy, it's a club of equal members, not a Guru Shishto or a Bharat. I shall come back to this contrast. Karai Alal was not a musician by profession. He was the inheritor of a leading Panda farm, which still exists today. Karai Alal had considerable land in Ghazipur and Andhra Gaha. He performed rituals, practiced music uh, in this house. Um, this picture shows the present uh, house of the Dairy Farm, Dairy family, uh, which is the sixth generation from the Nile Al, and uh, the opposite uh, of that house, there is a building where, which is the original um, dwelling of the Nile Al and his wife, his uh, Sora. Um, he practiced music in this house, did some wrestling, and um, taught himself in Estrat, and then eventually became very good at it, and he was performing in his clients' homes. Uh, he was called in by his clients for his musical accomplishments, not necessarily for his uh, funder services. Towards the end of, his, end of his short life, he was the best known performer of his art, almost certainly the first public performer of this instrument. Public concerts as we know it now were then unknown, but Calcutta City had many merchant and landlord homes where musicians performed for an invited audience. So well known was he in this set that he bought a house in North Calcutta, in the Shimla area, uh, where, as you know, many rich merchant families lived at one time. And also, Vivekananda's home is in the same area, and uh, I'll soon refer to Vivekananda's family in a moment. During the uh, India mutiny in 1857, a Khyal singer called Harulal, or Harida Singh, came from the troubled Chakhari state in central India to Gaya with his young son, and left him in the care of the Panda Ramhari Dhev. He did not travel very much to perform, but he left a very big legacy in Gaya. This is Hanuman Das Singh, uh, the young son. He was uh, renamed as Hanuman Das because he shared the same name as Ramani's son. Um, and uh, Ramani's son, uh, one of his sons was a Gaya Um Hanuman Das uh, lived for a long time, uh, almost entirely in, the, in Gaya town. He played as Raj, he also sang, he taught, and two of his students were the Esraj Maestro Chandrika Prasad Dubedi and his son Sony Singh, who, to quote a biographer, 
distinguished himself as one of the best harmonium players in India. The third member of the Esraj triad was Chandrika Prasad Dube. He was born in Pawai village, about 100 kilometers west of there. He learned piano singing from Hanuman Das, but finding his voice not up to the task, took up Esraj. It is said that Dube was mentored by both Hanayalal and Hanuman Das. Dube, for a while, was a court musician of Pandui, which is a Vyasa uh, very close to there. And as a court musician, he was uh, very well uh, looked after at that part. He had a, the king gave him an elephant to move around. But um, the life, uh, but his reputation as a musician was uh, had spread far and wide and induced him to leave this comfortable life as a court musician in a small village estate. He was traveling for the last 20 years of his life in various places and possibly also made a couple of discs, but I have not found any uh, trace of these. Um, he, um, somebody gave him uh, the title, honorific title, Esraja Hin. It's not very clear where he got it, but he was known as Esraja Hin. He was living in Pawai at the time of his death around 1965. Let's talk a little about the influence of these three individuals in the, but more outside the. Kanaya Valkheri was a familiar and popular figure in capital of his time around the 1890s. He is said to have influenced Estraj playing in the family of Devendranath Tagore. As we all know, Rabindranath had a huge effect on the popularity of Estraj. Um, so he must have been familiar with uh, the instrument from his early life. Kanaya also influenced the family of Norendra Dotto later Swami Vivekananda. He visited landlord estates located on the route between Gaya and Calcutta, like Anchek, where um, there is some record suggesting that Anayala came there and taught a few people, and that's the start of a significant Israel tradition there. Um, and um, several of these sites, like Panchet remembers Kanayla, but there is there's not, a, not a documentation about when and what, when he came along with them. At present, most classical Estraj players trace their lines to two um, lineages. One of them is the Sarangi Karana in Delhi, and another is Vishnupur. I do not know of any connection between Kanayala and, and Vishnupur, but Estraj in Vishnupur emerged after Kanayala became famous in Calcutta. So it's very likely that there was an influence or inspiration a Karana lineage prepared from Bengali sources lists several names as various tombs. Of these, the most important name is Shikal Chandra Mukhopadhyay, who was a bridge figure who connected the innovation of Gaya with the popularity of Sraj in Bengal. Unlike Anayala, Hanuman Das was not a Panna and he didn't travel very much. The nature of his influence cannot be understood in Guru Shishwa terms. A group photograph suggests ways to understand the nature of his influence. The photograph was taken, the, the, the picture in the middle, the photograph was taken in the late 1920s. Most photographs of music groups in these times show either touring groups or a concert stage, collective performance. This photograph does not belong in either class. It captures the spirit of what I've called a club an assortment of incompatible instruments assembled together. There's no hint of a hierarchy, who is the guru and who is the shishwa. The photo is meant to convey the sense of a democratic community rather than a hierarchy. And when you talk to the pandas about their musical heritage, that's the sense you get. That a lot of people just took it up because they thought it was, it was good to learn. Chandrika Prasad's legacy, rather like Kanayala, was inspirational. In the 1940s, he was often invited to music conferences, both as a solo artist and as an accompanist, and received this Esraj a hind title in Maldives. These travels brought him in contact with younger musicians, one of whom, Vishatari uh, Bhiman Mukherjee of Indar Khan Gorana, acknowledged publicly that Dubey had influenced his music quite significantly. Among his students, the Dubey students, two of them distinguished themselves as musicians, not only Patrick and his son and Dubey's son-in-law, Siaram Tiwari, both as Drupad singers, both as singers, the latter as a Drupad singer. Tiwari was one of the great names in the Narvana Drupad tradition. 
but to actually modernize and popularize a lot of the work that I have heard. But Dubey is not known to have left any student in his charge as such. Now these three artists no doubt made Gaya a hub. It made Gaya's reputation. But as the town's reputation grew, it became something else. It attracted musicians from the neighborhood and from far away. Around 1910, 1900, the town received a few high-profile musicians from the outside. The most influential of them were two people. One was this gentleman, Bhaiya Sahib Dampat Rao, popularly known as Bhaiya Sahib or Bhaiyaji. He was born of a romance between a member of the Gwalia royal family and a, and a famous dancer. He grew up with a very good foundation in dance, that is light classical music, and influenced a style of Tungri singing, which combined the two, dance music and Tungri and classical music, and reached its uh, peak in Lucknow. At the end of the 19th century, Ganpatra was a very famous singer. And the reason why he was famous was not just he was a good singer, but he also had adapted this uh, reed organ uh, harmonium uh, as an accompanying instrument. And then made an extraordinarily uh, powerful impression playing it while he sang. Another visitor to Gaya around this time was Mojuddin Khan. Mojuddin, as he was popularly known, belonged in a Punjabi musical family who had shifted residence from Patiala to Benares uh, sometime around 1858-16. Mojuddin's training was in the Punjabi style of Kel singing, but his friend Jagdeep Mishra advised him that with your voice you should take up Tungri, which he did. And then he was patronized by the merchants of Benaras and Calcutta and became a professional singer. Along with Ganpatra, Mojuddin is now regarded as the most important name behind the emergence of Tungri singing as a modern uh, style. Besides Numandas, the most important member of the Gaya club was his son, Soni Singh, or Sohin Singh, who is seated in Harmonium in the group photo. Um, yeah. One, 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 one figure at the right of the picture. <coughs> Otherwise, uh, Sohini Singh did not learn harmonium from any teacher. He just started playing the instrument. And with an acute ability to copy tunes that he had once heard, <coughs> he developed his style. He was a young man when Dhanpatra lived in the town. Ganpatra was warned by his friends of this ability of Sony Singh, that he could pick up anything that he heard. And he made sure that Singh was not within, not anywhere near, when he played compositions which were part of Gwalior uh, stock. It did happen on some occasions that after a performance by Ganpatra, where Singh was present, the next day Singh would play the same composition perfectly for the benefit of Ganpatra. Although Estrange was more or less finished with uh, Chandrika Prasad Dubey's death in 65, Gaya's tries with harmonium carried on for some time. But then that too eventually died. But Tungri lived on. But Gaya still has a few uh, accomplished Tungri singers, including Gajan um, Sijua. And if Gaya's musical reputation today is because of Tungri and, and Sijua is the most eminent exponent, he's also a panda. Um, and a very established business person of Gaya, the owner, uh, owner of lots of businesses. But Gaya was already in decline in the, in the latter half of the 20th century. From the 1960s, few of the town's musicians enjoyed the reputation that attached to, to, to Singh or to Dubey. Few were known outside the town or had become an all India figure. Estraj and Harmonium Harmoni flourished elsewhere, not here. Gaya fell into obscurity. I will summarize. Let me return to the two stories that I started with, Gharana in transition and invention of tradition, and use the example of Gaya to outline a different, a third narrative. I will draw several lessons from this study. Um, in Gharana in transition, the first lesson is about circulation, migration, contact, interaction between people who carry different types of skills together, and that, the role of that kind of interaction in the making of Indian music. In Gharana in transition story, migration stands for a tragedy. People lose something which is very important 
and they are forced to migrate to port city among other people who do not appreciate who they are. And it's, it's, it's a story of, up, uh, of displacement, of uprooting, and decline. In Gaia's history, migration and circulation have the opposite meaning. Because it was a pilgrim center, rich Hindus knew Gaia well and visited this place. The elite pandas traveled to their clients. They were extremely, um, extremely mobile people, at least the top people. Through this process, Gaia's priests met the high culture of the poor city and absorbed it. Offbeat and talented musicians came to the town, and the exchange that followed strengthened Gaia's reputation outside the town and its attraction to musicians outside. Um, there's a sociologist, uh, Mark Ranover, who created this very interesting distinction between strong ties and weak ties among people. And one made this argument that strong ties are hierarchical ties, such as uh, you have within a caste or uh, among parents and children. Um, Weak ties are ties between people who are not related by any power relations, but they came in contact with each other as in a cosmopolitan port city. And the argument was that more novel kind of information, more innovation can happen uh, when weak ties are the dominant type of ties. ties. Um, he called this paper the strength of weak ties. I see in Gaia the strength of weak ties. Secondly, Gaia has lessons about the communities that formed around classical music. Gaia is a community, a hierarchical one, based on Ustad Shagir hierarchy. In Gaia, we see the emergence of democratic, club-like electives, which develop around a common purpose. The club culture of the Pantas helped it form, but of course, club culture doesn't explain all of it. Gaia's reputation also depended on this emergence of highly unusual um, individuals who combine uh, very talented artists who help to emerge from within this black culture and shape it to some extent. Third, Gaia has lessons about the gentle towns of North, Northern and Eastern India. Towns that had a big circulation of wealthy pilgrims like Benares or Mathura also saw a musical flourish. The anthropological literature on the gentle towns are largely overlooked or underestimated this dimension and therefore hold the priests in somewhat low esteem. But if we only look at them as suppliers of a religious service, we can be somewhat dismissive. But I think but there was much more to the story. The priests had were very culturally engaged people and had a significant role in extending the cultural frontier of the 20th century. I'll make a further point about innovation. <coughs> Neither the Karanayan tradition nor the invention of tradition tells us very clearly what innovation means in classical music. The Gharana model gives the impression that the old world was the great place. Everything else was a corruption or a poor copy of the old world. The nationalism model does not discuss the quality of music as such. But we cannot understand Blair without understanding what Esraj and Harmonia meant for modern music because Blair made this book. These instruments did not emerge from the Indo-Islamic Harana heritage. Only a new type of place, a new type of club like Gaya could be eclectic enough to choose these offbeat mediums to express themselves. Therefore, Israj plays such an important part in the story and in the history of Gaya. I'll suggest a final lesson, which is about the decline of Gaya after the 1960s. Why did it happen? A part of the answer is common to similar decline of the Gharanas of Uttar Pradesh, the old world. Most North Indian musical sects did not encourage women to perform in public, to teach, even to learn. On this point, the middle class musicians of Maharashtra, Bengal, or Tamil Nadu were much more liberal and very different. They did not make so much distinction between men and women, and music flourished in these places not in the whole world. In the long run, these were more sustainable problems because we will learn more. But another reason for Gaia's decline, and Gaia, was, Gaia shares that, uh, that same history. It's, it's an extremely uh, male kind of place. The public culture is very male. But another reason for Gaia's decline was specific to the town. It was successful in creating a club of connoisseurs <laughs> of music. 
but club culture does not always give you high quality performance <coughs> or training. You need a certain tradition of pedagogy and instruction to do that. That element Gaia probably lacked. Its greatest figures were apparently self-taught. And self-taught people can be extraordinary musicians, not exalted stops them from becoming terrific musicians, and they were. But probably self-taught people are not necessarily great teachers. I will stop there. Thank you. To perform three roles, right? Multiple roles as soloists and accompanists, and um, they were also teaching. Um, are there any records of whom they accompanied? I mean, they accompanied vocalists, obviously. So, um, are there any records of um, who are the musicians that they accompany? And my second question is, um, are there any records, gramophone records of these musicians? Because um, Goharjan was recorded in 1903, so and they, they were living right up to 1940, 1965, so are there any? And one more uh, point just I want to make about Gharana. Um, like for a 21st century practitioner, um, you know, the way I look at gharana is not something archaic or outdated because I still think that being trained in a particular, gharana doesn't represent anymore the hierarchical structure today because in some sense it is, um, it represents a musical <coughs> style and ideology. So if, if you are sort of trained in a particular style, then I think there are there have been innumerable examples that you actually become a better artist because um, you are able to imbibe uh, influences from a lot more different uh, you know, uh, styles and different gharanas. So you are not really uh, dogmatic about representing one single uh, um, ideology. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't think there is any evidence, I have not seen any evidence <coughs> of uh, these individuals accompanying vocal musicians. Um, uh, the, the biographies we have, the printed biographies we have never mentions that. And I think um, with, um, with the way that they are described in this literature, people who have heard it, the heart of playing solo, uh, I think it will be quite um, quite a challenge for a vocal musician to be accompanied by them. I, I read that way. They were extremely accomplished as solo instrumentalists. Um, uh, okay. the, the most likely person who might have been an accompanist is Chanti Professor Dubey. Uh, because he lived through a time when there were many vocal musicians, uh, many concerts happening, and he was also part of the set. But um, there's no evidence that he actually sat with somebody and played with someone. And uh, which, um, which is consistent with my story that they really were projecting themselves as players of a start rather than an accompanist. Yeah. Uh, just an intervention. See, Sarangi was, has become one of the most uh, uh, common accompanying instrument also. And it is a very major solo instrument. So what do you think is a reason that Israj um, has not been yeah. sort of an accompanying in Hindustani vocal, uh, for, for Hindustani vocal classes. That's an interesting question. Uh, I think uh, we, should, we can really speculate about that, but there must be others who have uh, similar questions waiting. I mean, one, one, of the, one of the senses I have is that the, um, the Israj became very closely identified with Dr. Nani Gopal Shumi, and that was good for it, but that was also bad for it as, uh, as a classical uh, solo instrument. Uh, but that's my opinion. Um, Chandrika Prasad Dubey actually did make uh, discs, but they have not been they have not been traced anywhere in the normal collections or archives. Uh, but um, there is a record that he did in 1930s, for example, he did uh, a disc. On, on the Gharanas, um, you are right. Um, the, the, the strange uh, the part of what this ethnomusicology set has been trying to do is to get get some handle on what the Gharana is. Because they know that or they believe that without that term, we cannot write this history. The musicians constantly prefer that term. Uh, so we have to understand it. But when they do it, they find, and that is my impression of that literature, is that it's totally confused about what it is. 
Um, there's a, I mean, it refers to style, it refers to uh, region, it refers to a, a certain hierarchy of, uh, a certain lineage of a master student. And um, in the end, you get terms like, it's a, I'm mean, quoting somebody, social musical compound, which doesn't mean anything to me. Um, so what it means to, I mean, when, when you see standard lists of Haranas, all you see are masters and then it's like a family tree, I mean, masters and the uh, list of the students who follow uh, these masters. Um, that gives you a sense of uh, a guru shishu kind of hierarchy. That's, that's, the, that's what it is. But of course, if you live through it, then as you say, it could mean a very different thing. Um, I don't think anybody else, anybody has really sorted this problem out of what it is really. Uh, it, it would be very difficult to do that because it's constantly colored by the impression of musicians or what it is. Gurus, uh, as I very briefly learned from him, was the Bhutti Bhutti in the And um, uh, I, I mean, he, he gave me, a long time ago, he gave an impression of how Sarani became a solo instrument, which follows this uh, pattern uh, that I find in Israel very closely, uh, which is that, yes, it was a uh, um, accompanying instrument in the concert, but privately many people play um, solo. But the solo concert happened through the agency of uh, three or four very distinguished um, players who changed the style of their playing to adapt to solo playing. And uh, that is Bundu Khan and uh, Roman Mishra and a few other people. So they, are, they can be identified, the, the big innovators who, who made it into a solo instrument because they were not just so good, but because they had a certain idea about how to express uh, as a soul nature. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I leave out these things. My voice is pretty, you no, see. No, no. no. It's, 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 it's really disturbed me. I just can't. It's a kind of barrier. Uh, now you talked about this uh, music and society in late colonial India. You are not saying that colonial or colonists, they did really tinker with our uh, tradition of music. I mean this, uh, say for example in our modern education, yeah, you would find a lot of uh, records where you would see that British tried to introduce things. But in certain areas, they didn't do it. Say, for example, folk music. Say, for example, I'm sorry, uh, folk art, different forms of folk art. And another thing is this art, uh, both classical and folk music. They never tried to, you see, introduce any new thing. Am I right? I just wanted to know. Thank I don't you. Agree with you. Uh, I don't agree with you. The, the use of the word colonial in this. Um, it's not just as a time marker, but also the fact that colonialism comes into play in the story because um, a lot of the, uh, the uh, understanding of where music stands in our society comes from nationalism, uh, which is a reaction to colonialism. Um, and of course, there's also this understanding that, because, that colonialism stands for a certain type of economic system where there are lots of marshals and lots of uh, landlords and uh, with time and money to spare. And they are uh, some of them are engaged in excessive music to build a sponsorship uh, economics. But it's nothing directly, you see. It's not a result. Yes, I mean, the society gets uh, changed. Society gets changed and automatically other things also. Yes. And the period is this new colonial uh, period. Am I right? Yes, no, I, I agree with you.
एजुकेशनल सिस्टेम मध्य जिस पढ़ाना हार परिप्रेक्षित घराना सिसटेम क्या आवं जेटा देखा जाए जो घराना सिसटेम जो रिगार्डा देखा देखे जान से इूनिवार्सिटी सिसटेम मध्य सरकम रिगार्ड देखते यार संगे घरानार इूनिवार्सिटी सिसटेम के लिए एमक कि भलो जिन जाए जेटा भलोभ चलते
things that we have in our larder. Okay, what is Yeah, well, and dance is a little different from this category, but. Uh, but Uh, 